Hi, this is Private Air Station, and today we'll bring you day 507 of Putin's invasion into Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Alexei Rostovich, and Russian opposition politician, lawyer, and blogger Mark Fagan. Special thanks go today to Veles, Inc., Igor, and Yelena Einhorn, and of course, thank you, Bill, for your super thanks. Much appreciated, guys. Thank you for your support. And with this, uh, let's go into day 507 and the aftermath of NATO summit. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Saturday, July 15th. Time is 1 minute past 10 in Kiev, same time in Moscow. And we're doing our usual stream, day 507, with Alexei Rostovich. Alexei, glad to see you. Good evening, everybody. We have about 35,000 starting with us on this weekend day and over 10,000 already clicked the like button. Huge ask, despite of it being Saturday, please uh, be a little more active in sharing links to that stream. Click the likes button and help us to promote this material as wide as we can. Do not forget to subscribe to Fagin Live. We do need your subscriptions as well as Alexei Rostovich. The descriptions are below. And of course, if you are listening or watching that in English, please subscribe to the Privateer Station. Also, I want to say that today, given that it is Saturday, we might start pulling some questions from chat to ask questions to Alexei. So please, those who want to ask some questions at the end of the stream, post some questions there and just put a mark there, a question for Alexei, a question to mark. This is a new option we're experimenting with to add some interactivity to our communication. All right, and with that, let us, let us start. Look, Alexei, all this week, I'm just kind of summarizing the whole result, I guess, trying to. It was dedicated mostly in the news to the summit in Vilnius. That was one of the most important events. And regarding the results of the summit, there were interesting news coming out related to some activities uh, in the negotiations front done by Americans and other allies. And then there was a plan announced of NATO to create a 300,000 military force along the border with Russia. And it is to be spread throughout different countries, all the NATO countries that are connected with, to Russia by the border, Finland, Sweden, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and basically all along the border. And we'll touch upon that. But do you think the information that was discussed the light in the light of what was decisions that were made during that summit, do you think NATO is even ready to engage in war with Russia? Why I am asking this question is that they gave themselves seven years to create that group. What if the war starts in three years? What will they fight with? Mark, Mark, I think you're running a little too far. The first question would be, what would Russia fight with? Well, no, 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 I, I'll push it further. If Russia has nothing to fight with, maybe it's time to start fighting with them. No, Mark. You know, if we look at Russia and see how much troops can they deploy on any battlefront outside of the Ukraine front, uh, they probably can put a couple of battalions and they'll probably be done with in about five minutes by the forces of NATO in the scenario of a hypothetical conflict. So, I don't know. I think NATO are considering that one day the war will be over, that sanctions will be removed. Then somebody, instead of Putin, because Putin will not last forever, if that person will not be a, democ a democratically elected leader, then Russia might eventually accumulate enough resources to conduct some military campaign. But one needs to understand that 
For the first time in many years, they have signed an agreement or a plan of a general war of NATO with Russia. And there used to be battalion, multinational battalions, uh, somewhat close to the border with Russia. Now we're talking about brigades. We're talking about increasing the numbers. And we're generally returning to the days of Cold War with the correction that they're not opposing Soviet Union, but they're opposing Putin's Russia that is already generally downgraded, downplayed by, uh, downgraded by Ukrainian military to a huge degree. And they're preparing to be able to face that. And it also shows that they are not considering the, that Russia will fall apart, but they're also considering that Russia might actually accumulate enough resources. So kind of with one hand, they'll be lifting sanctions after this war, and with the other hand, they'll be fortifying their military. You know, kind of uh, cyclical self-service to, to itself, just like somebody uh, joked recently about why are you guys being afraid of AI taking over your jobs? Half the humanity will be writing viruses, another half will be writing antiviruses. Only now it will be all in relation to artificial intelligence uh, software. So do you think NATO is ready to confront Moscow? I think they, they are. I think, yeah, they just answered this question. Americans by themselves can take on Russia if they want to. Yeah, you know, but there are peculiarities in this because there is also a thesis being voiced that Ukraine needs to be integrated into NATO. So Ukraine would be fighting for NATO. Mark, it's an old thesis and for NATO, let's just take a look at the border. Finnish army, they can mobilize rapidly, 250,000. Swedish army, Turkish army, I think they have 600,000 of the usual contingent. French army, 225. And that's all American, uh, that's all European continent. That's even without Americans arriving here. Plus there is a naval and air components. It may happen that nobody will have anything to drive to the location of NATO or United States in Russia after the initial round of aerial attacks. So, okay, so why not to invite Ukraine right now? Because, well, because right now it means the immediate imminent war with Russia for NATO. They don't want that, they want something else. They want to rebalance the situation with China. All right. And in relation to this, we are asking a poll question of our viewers. And today it sounds very simple. Is NATO ready for war with Russia? Yes or no? And we'll take a look at the end of the stream at what does our audience think. Okay, returning back to summit, this question was brought up several times, was discussed, and some of the attackers of the Ukrainian government, not necessarily fans of Russia, but they were bringing up that the form of communication and the form of objections from Ukrainian government, some invectives from American delegation, that these forms are not acceptable. And at the end, actually, they, I don't see the, any difference in the results of NATO. It seems like they came to the same results as they would have come otherwise. But in your opinion, does it matter the presence of diplomatic and non-diplomatic style and statements that maybe hinder some elements of discussion? Mark, everybody is right and everybody is wrong at the same time. One can understand our president, right? Very simply. His people and soldiers are dying. And when he's being told that for F-16 you need infrastructure, it is so difficult and complex, then you can follow up with a few questions. What were you doing the previous year and a half, almost? Or at least after Kherson was liberated? What, in nine months you could not create infrastructure? 
I cannot believe that. So, in 91, uh, 2003, for war in Iraq, you deployed everything in half a year, and here nine months is too long. All right, let's imagine for F-16s you need infrastructure, but for Atakams, what infrastructure you need? It's a, it's a missile, right? You deliver a missile and we shoot it. It's easy, you don't need infrastructure. And there is no argument explaining why Atakams are not present on the front, especially on the background that Britain and France have already supplied compatible technology, scalps and uh, storm shadows. Well, as I understand, it's easier to shoot scalp from air defense system. Right, it is correct. Atacams is a little more difficult to intercept. So, if there are no arguments and yet we're still not given that support, what mood would the president be in? It's his people being killed daily. His soldiers, his civilians, kids are dying. Zaluzhny gave an interview to Washington Post. What did he say there? Yeah, we'll talk about this one too. He did ask a question, how dare you to limit me in the way, ways and means of saving my people? Of course, we will be talking on heightened emotions and in louder volume. And it's understandable. They'll be angry and they'll be talking in loud voices because daily they get the data that that many people died and casualties would have been much smaller if that infrastructure was built or if these missiles were delivered. On the other hand, you can of course understand the West because how they think. Wait, we threw everything, we are working for you, we are fighting with Russia, holding China, you are dependent upon us and your budget and you could have said at least thank you. But this is a rhetoric thank you, right? We are saying thank you daily. But are we talking about form or content? I think they are getting thanks, but they don't like the form. Probably, because they're used to other speed and other form, that collective decisions take time, and they don't like additional emotional injections because that will bubble up to media, media can turn it into some form of public opinion that can affect the position of politicians and they're basically operating as the leaders during the times of peace. And Zaluzhny and Zelensky, they're talking as two main representatives of military political leadership of the country that is at war for its life. And one is leading the whole country, another is commanding all the troops of that country where people are dying daily. And that's the difference. In a year and a half, everybody is tired from all that polite attitude in Ukraine. It's hard to continue picking words. Because if you look at the tasks that Ukraine is solving at this conflict, including the tasks for NATO and what tasks uh, NATO is solving in this conflict for itself. And we may turn out to have a pretty big imbalance that Ukraine is achieving a ton of goals for NATO, for United States and other NATO allies. For example, NATO countries have took over the market of liquid natural gas, the European market of that. Is not that a historical opportunity? that Russia is out of this market. Another one is that we completely threw Russia back for the next 15 years in their military capacity. And nobody knows for how many years would that be available. We also closed Baltic Sea as a result of our action. We zeroed out Peter the Great's uh, results in Russia, who was chopping out that window into the Baltic Sea. And now Finland and Sweden are joining NATO forces and all these Russian emperors from Peter the Great onward, including commies and Putin now, all that is canceled. That window is closed. And that was done due to the efforts of Ukrainian military and including 
territorial defense and everybody basically who is resisting Russian occupation. And if you look at the memorandums and other documents signed with Ukraine before, and we are essentially taking away a lot of Russian capability, a lot of Putin's capability to wage wars, and we are lowering it down in the pecking order and creating different situation with China. We are concluding our goals, we are reaching our goals, we are paying it with blood, we are paying with our future, with our children, with our civilians, and our allies are paying only with money and getting huge opportunities and dividends. Just remember that gas market of Europe and so on. So this equation is interesting and I would argue about the form and the necessity. The other thing is that they can attack the content. They fight with corruption on our side. Still a lot of room for improvement, lack of systemic effort that one can bring in increasing Ukrainian partnership qualities economically and in other industries and some elements that they read as not exactly appropriate distribution of the Western aid. So they could attack certain factual things here and they can say that, hey, you got a historic chance as well to remove an old legacy system that was feasting on Ukraine's body and you can remove that and you are doing it, but you're not doing it fast enough. So there are a lot of questions from one side to another and they can argue and we're not damsels in distress, not to offend damsels because some of them are worth a few men, but in general you know, it's it's that meme that it's not important what you said, it's more important how you said. And I think we'll not fall into this meme that we can speak in loud voices, but we need to address the actual, the factual data. That's why I said in our last stream we should take out the calculator and start addressing the facts. Because morale and all these values and humanitarian things, they exist, but they're not the driving factors. I think we should go back to the table with a calculator and money. And the West needs to see what is their benefit, their financial monetary benefit. And we need to also look at that factual element so we can elevate our partnership qualities. For example, Poland is not asking from us much. They're buying our stuff. Turks, they on the summit were very loud. They actually were in a position when they were almost slapped sanctions on themselves. And sometimes they take positions from which the rest of NATO allies almost faint. But they still achieve their goals and they're fine. And you can remember Gibraltar, Spain and Britain. You can remember Greek and Turkish conflict. Well, there was not a real hot war there. Well, right, they were not shooting at each other, but there were enough military maneuvers around. On Cyprus, yes. No, no, no. In in Gibraltar as well, and you can also remember British Icelandic fish wars, fishing wars. So to put it delicately, the volume of conversation doesn't really affect the outcome with NATO. They've done, they've been there before. But I'm still for bringing out the calculator and making sure everybody's interested, looking at the finance at the totals because otherwise everybody's right and everybody's uh, wrong in something and this is a difference of real positions and difference of understanding the world uh, like in that saying the hungry and the well-fed they see the world differently because they're here to they're on the summit to negotiate and discuss and in the meantime we're getting missiles on our heads so, and that's the difference all right We've been live for 19 minutes. We have 135,000 with us. About 47,000 of you clicked the like button. Do not forget to subscribe as well. Let's go to the map, perhaps, and take a look at what's happening on the front. Do you agree with a statement that there is some slowdown 
on this week at least, maybe since the end of last week. Let's also finish a couple more things, Mark. Okay, okay. Ben Wallace is resigning, right? He is resigning in autumn, right. Do you think it's connected? I don't think. I allow our viewers to find connection between two different facts. All right. Let's take a look at the map. There is no slowdown, actually. The situation is very complex and actually very heated on the line of Kriminaya Kupinsk in the east. Right? Yes, Russian troops are very actively attacking. They brought a lot of resources locally, and our situation for our troops there is very difficult. Which, for a situation overall, I think is a positive sign. It means that they're doing everything they can to, to force us to move our extra troops, our reserves, from the south to the eastern front, which shows that the situation in the south is much more difficult for them than they want to acknowledge. So are they moving, Alexei, on that front, on the eastern, northeastern front? Yeah, right. Let's uh, let me zoom to that map. Let's start in the northeastern corner. So where you see the arrows at the bottom, you can see Krasnodarinska and general direction. That's where they're trying to move. They're trying to move towards Yapal. And you can see that protrusion is pretty notable. A few days ago, that protrusion was a bit shorter. And they're also trying to get to Belogorovka and Zlatarevka. They actually gathered some paratroopers, some tank groups, and serious artillery reserves. And they're doing everything they can to make sure that we throw more reserves here. And our command understands what they're doing. And they're playing our own game. We'll see how it will play out. So situation is difficult, but we are coping with it. We'll see how it goes. We understand also if you go down to Bakhmut, we are going to Berkhovka. You can see uh, our protrusion towards the road to cut it off in the north. And also down south near Kleshevka. Because if we cut the road, Bakhmut, that uh, passes by Bakhmut, and the situation in some parts of this front will become very difficult. And our troops are continuing to push forward, despite their numeric disadvantage versus the enemy. Also near Avdiivka, nothing is quiet here. They continue storming that fortification region. And on the southern front, we are also active. We just changed the character of this war, and we can acknowledge now that we're mostly putting an emphasis there for destruction on the destruction of artillery and their force rather than deoccupation of the territory we are wearing them out but we are definitely taking some new positions and it just overall our bet there is not on liberating the territories it's more on destroying their units and once we wear them down, then it becomes much easier for us to move on the ground. And that's why the arrows don't show much, but we are grinding them down very rapidly. It was not me who noticed that, but I will speak it out loud. If you notice that recent, in the recent couple of weeks, the share of their MLRS systems that is being destroyed has increased rapidly. That can mean that they are down on artillery systems, that we generally are winning the counter-artillery war, and they're moving the MLRS systems to the front to compensate for the lack of artillery. And they started getting being hit. That explains the increased numbers of reactive systems being destroyed. Also, interesting things happening in the Russian military and parallel. For example, the commander of 106th uh, paratroopers Division was removed, General Silvestrov. Before that, the commander of the 7th paratroopers, General Kortnev, was removed. And here, paratroopers are recording an interesting message. We paratroopers sending a warning that we will not tolerate any threats 
to the name of our General Tiplinsky in case there is any threat to his well-being and position in life. And if you try to imprison him, keep in mind that we will take off from our positions on the front and we'll go as far as we need to to free our commander. And this is the message sent by paratroopers from the front. And that cannot not make us happy because Russian military is already showing cracks at the seams. By the way, there is another missile attack in Zaporozhye right now. So that's what I'm saying. We need to be stubborn and we need to keep pressing because everything is bad there. It is really getting worse. And with these cleansings and all these Popovs and others who are writing, recording tearful messages and all these threats by paratroopers in relation to removal of their leaders, this may result in a new military mutiny. This doesn't add health or capability to Russian military, and it will crack. And it's not the number of liberated territories that matters. It's systemic efforts in destroying their capacity to wage war. Because under the pressure of losses, they escalate a lot of inner conflicts and they start looking for guilty. And the soil there is already fertile for all these inner fighting relation between higher command and Wagner and relation between their Russian Guard inner troops and the external military. And there are a lot of flames picking up. And some people, some smart people on their side are fanning these flames. So our job is to continue with our systemic pressure and they eventually will crumble. And on this stage, that's what we're facing. These are our main tasks. All right, so that's it on the map. 150,000 are with us already, and we've been live for about 26 minutes. Out of other topics we wanted to bring up regarding the nuclear strikes, there was an article by Karaganov that, and Karaganov is uh, one of FSB, Putin's court press analyst members. He had an article about it being good for Russia to maybe do a preventive nuclear strike on Polish cities. And today, another group, a think tank, so to say, of FSB experts, came back with a counter article addressing his statement saying that these members of international, uh, of the foreign defense uh, chamber, consider these calls and scenarios unacceptable. In January, their leader, Sergei Karaganov, wrote that article, and now the whole chamber comes out with a, with a statement saying that they do not agree with, the, with his article. I think it's a puppeteered show that one of them came with one position and then the rest are playing it, peddling it back. And now they're saying, no, no, never, we're not going to do that. What do you think it means? And does it mean the threat of explosion on Zaporozhye nuclear power plant or the threat of tactical nuke is being de-escalated? Mark, there was never a serious nuclear threat from Russia in this war. Blow up of the Zaporozhye nuclear fact, uh, power plant, yeah, that's still a risk, but using tactical nu nukes is low. Uh, main reason is China. China is definitely against Russia escalating that into a nuclear. Because most analysts also saying that, and it's not just China, it's also NATO, because if Russia will use tactical news nukes in Ukraine, the West will have to destroy Russian troops in Ukraine. Now imagine that barrage of Tomahawks and Russia just lost 300,000 troops that are placed on the front in Ukraine. And then what, what, what happens next? You can take a battalion and walk to Moscow or to Vladivostok if you want to. And China, India, and Turkey, they are these three rivers that are feeding Russian Federation in some capacity during these difficult times for them, during the sanctions and losing the markets. So they do not want to break relations with these three. And there are a couple more news. Um, the visit of the president of South Korea to Kiev. 
is happening today. Our beloved neighbor Poland, after all the difficulties they had, right now they have only two major sources of arms where they buy arms. It's United States and South Korea. And South Korea is about the only country in the world, except the uh, United States and uh, a couple of European huge countries. Uh, they are a leader in a lot of technological branches, not industrial branches, maybe ex except submarines and uh, nuclear, but otherwise they're a very strong partner. This is a very prospective partnership. So yesterday their president came to see presidents of Poland and they were discussing how can they help Ukraine. And today president of South Korea is in Kiev. And I think this is one of the main news during the whole time of war. Why? Because if Koreans will actually start helping us, it will change the balance of forces in our favor. I'll remind our viewers that M109 howitzers, 155 millimeter caliber, in storage only, they have 1,200. In the United States, they have about seven times that, right? Right. But overall, we got about 500, all kinds of howitzers, self-propelled, moving, not moving, all different sorts. So South Korea has a very wide capability range. And also, if you calculate the number of shells that they manufacture, they can probably beat NATO in the overall production. And there are a lot of good technological elements that uh, an army can pick on and purchase and get from them. So this is, um, in my opinion, is one of the most important news. And the possible organized cooperation with, North, with South Korea. And not just supplies, but also possibilities to create military industrial partnerships, because Koreans also have a lot of experience of dispersing their production under threat of... Uh, neighbor so that's the good news all right then perhaps let's talk about another side it's good president of korea visiting kiev and poland i think there'll be interesting announcements coming out of it yeah they already made some announcement they announced 150 million worth of humanitarian aid but there is also a military partnership that is not going to hit the news right right but it's very interesting of course Okay, let's discuss uh, another thing, hustle around the Green Deal. You remember the chronology, you remember how Erdogan bet Putin over, gave out the elder commanders of Azov, and they arrived to Ukraine. Moscow is screaming about them being released to Lvov and meeting with Zelensky there. And Moscow is uh, being agitated that they do not like being attack from behind and below and Erdogan's reaction was that you misunderstood me I did not take anything any responsibilities on myself you agreed that about the details of that deal with Kiev and I did not agree about anything so Kiev asked me and I released them the prisoners and about the green deal Erdogan mentioned that himself and other news agencies commented on that too, reaffirming that news that Moscow is coming back to a Green Deal. There was a silence from Moscow. Peskov came out and said, we haven't made a full decision yet, we haven't made a statement, but there is definitely some motion in there that uh, Agricultural Bank of Russia might get uh, SWIFT code back. So do you think Russia will return to the Green Deal in light of all these new developments and information? And how will it look? Will it look like they've been ahead again? It's difficult to prognosticate that, Mark, but we can uh, give a prognosis of what happens if they don't. They'll hurt. What, what do you mean? How? Erdogan will find a way to make it hurt. What about your prognosis? They have a million of capabilities from Libya to Nagorny Karabakh. By the way, you heard that in Nagorny Karabakh by 2025 there'll be no russian peacekeepers left they'll be withdrawn i don't know by which agreement and whoever reads it how it means that they have a year and a half there and after that it's uh ciao it's goodbye and there are no russian troops on the territory separating armenia and azerbaijan 
That's correct. There'll be no peacekeepers. Well, it seems like even lubricant is being taken away from Putin. Yeah, Putin is nowhere near the class of game displayed by Aliyev and Erdogan. So, yeah, there'll be no peacekeepers by the time. So, you think this is all a directed campaign to, da to bring down Putin's authority in the area and Erdogan wants to be a center of power in that part of the world? From the very beginning of war, Mark, I was saying that everything will be better with Azerbaijan and it'll just take some time for them to, for the effects to emanate. But since that war started, situation for Azerbaijan will become much better. Okay, one more thing. Kirill, uh, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, appealed that Putin his representative, the representative of his church in uh, Ukraine under arrest may affect the health and well-being of that person. Okay, I have a counter question. Can he also scream in his orthodox Christian style about the life and well-being of Mikhail Saakashvili? No, no, he doesn't want to do that. Yeah, I thought so. And. Regarding this guy who uh, he screamed about, there is no threat to his health and well-being, and he is already making statements. We are not Georgian government. We will not be killing a person who is being put in prison. So you're basically Russian patriarch. You're just transferring the behavior of your people onto us. That's not going to work. As for the policy and the decisions around Kiev, Pechorska Lavra, a religious uh, landmark in uh, Kiev, we are in agreement that definitely there has to be nothing Moscow in present and there, but at the same time we have to be careful because it is a big part of our churches in Ukraine, the Orthodox Church, uh, under Moscow Patriarchy, and we need to differentiate the church's organization from people, from the parish, uh, parishioners who are going there, from believers. And this is a very delicate situation that is fully on the shoulders of security service of Ukraine, how to handle it, and so far they seem to be pretty effective. So it's about the differentiation of two. All right, all right, I got it. Uh, leaders of African countries, the participants of the peace mission, uh, that came recently, they will have a chance to communicate with Putin on the margins of the summit, Russia-African summit that will take place at the end of July. Congo, Senegal, Uganda, South Africa, and several others, they are hoping to meet with Putin during that summit. Why this news is good is that there is still some hassle going on around Putin's possible visit to the BRICS summit in South Africa in August. And with that, Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, is coming out and saying that please do not come because it creates a difficult situation for South Africa in regards to executing the order of International Criminal Court. Moscow is uh, hesitant and uh, it's being suggested that Lavrov, Minister of Foreign Affairs, should go to the BRICS summit instead of Putin. And there are no given guarantees to Putin by South African Republic that he'll not be arrested and Putin is still thinking whether to go or not to go. Personally, I think he'll not going to come, maybe do a video uh, message. And also they're doing that uh, Africa Russia summit in July in Russia, so they probably will be meeting the leaders over there and not on the BRICS summit. Most likely it will happen this way because their Tsar is uh, peeing himself, getting scared, and yeah, there's a play of word uh, Tsar being a synonym to the word pee, so the Ukrainians are playing with the sound of it. So 
yeah, South Africa is a signatory of the Roman statute, so they have to. And Putin will not go to countries that have signed it. Lavrov likely will go instead. And we did talk that uh, a big question would be to even get there, because there'll be a probable need to refuel on the way, and if you need to land in a hostile country that uh, is eager to arrest. So very likely Putin is not going to any of these summits. Got here. 164,000 are watching us. Over 63,000 click the like button. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel. And we're continuing with our poll. By the 40th minute of our stream, is NATO ready for the war with Russia? Out of 49,000 viewers who voted, yes, 36%. And no, NATO is not ready for war with Russia is 64%. And thank you, and please continue voting. I also want to say that FSB recently brought another one more news. They brought a couple guys on the screen who supposedly were going to assassinate Simonian, the propagandist, and Sobchak, a semi liberal propagandist in Russia. And Simonian, I can understand somewhat, if that was true. Sobchak, I'm laughing. Let me open a mystery here. One needs to be a complete idiot to pay money to some neo-Nazi groups in Russia. Because all of these groups are fully infiltrated and fully controlled by FSB, and it's absolutely unreal for any special services to engage with them. We don't have idiots who would engage with them, so this is not a real news. And yeah, that has very bad optics, even the way they, they're showing it. It's funny. And on the other hand, murdering Simonian, what gives us? What uh, gives us that? Create a martyr out of that propagandist? Yeah, you know, they can assassinate her themselves and tell that Aristovich did that. Right, but what's the what's the meaning? <laughs> what if what if they play another story of uh, I don't know, sexual attack as well, not just a murder? Well well, okay, I'm going in the wrong field with my uh, salty jokes. Let's finish the poll. We're at the end. Fifty one thousand three hundred and fifty six votes. 36% saying, yes, NATO is ready to fight with Russia. 64 think, no, it isn't. Our viewers, majority, by majority, decided that NATO, NATO is not ready to fight with Russia. All right, a few questions from chat, as we promised. There are a lot of questions, um, very different, disconnected, but still. People have been accusing us from discussing the topic. I don't think we ever avoid any topic, but some Freddy is asking a question. Why West is fearing the Ukraine, is scaring the Ukraine with limiting the supplies of military and forcing them to negotiation table, while last year on the 9th of May he signed land lease program. We did uh, speak at length about land lease. Perhaps you can talk more about it. Does it work? Does it not work? Do you need it? because that's an endless story and also the accusations that we are avoiding this question. Well, they sh they, they're the ones who should be asked about land lease. What do you think? I, I'm not even thinking about it. I am of opinion that we'll take weapons in any form, shape or program. And those people who think that if we repeated the words uh, land lease all the time and we'd, we'd already be given F-16, F-16, 20 F-35 and a big space gun, those people are very, um, to put it politely, disconnected from reality. They believe that they can conjure land lease by repetition, that bringing up this topic will change the principal position of the American leadership that has made their mind about not supplying certain arms to Ukraine. I pity that party of uh, pro-Trump uh, people and I generally understand them and yeah, I would even give them a cup of hot tea and a blanket 
and hold the hand, but talk about something else or even listen to their grievances about land lease because that's the fact. And as a doctor, yeah, if somebody is getting really excited, I can, as a doctor, I can hold the hand. <laughs> um, last question for today. Dmitry Mezenzev is asking, what do you think about the weight of the guarantees for security of Ukraine? Do you think it has a chance of being as effective as uh, Budapest memorandum? Yeah, I think G7 is a more difficult, uh, is, is a more serious document than the previous memorandum, because G7 has countries like Japan that are not members of EU or NATO and they're on the other side of the world. And to get these countries like that to join such a position means that there was a serious discussion and a serious uh, logicizing about how to and what to do and should we do it. So generally it's a stronger document than the previous declaration. All right, we've been live for about 45 minutes. We're over our usual limit. Thank you, dear viewers, for participating in that, for participating in that stream. We had uh, over 166,000 with us today. 67,000 did click the like button. And we still ask you to continue sharing links in the social media, bring more people to see our streams and click the like button each click brings it to the eyes of 10 more on youtube and do not forget to subscribe to fagin live to alexa Rostovich. the links are down below and to the private here station if you are listening or watching that in english and then see you on monday at 10 pm alexia right the usual time usual place we'll be glad to see you and i think it's a good good thing that we are starting to pick questions from chat let's give it a little more time Right, we just need to maybe pick, uh, give a certain segment of a show, maybe pick five questions that we answer. And a last piece of information, Georgian leadership in the face of their president, Surabishvili, had gave presidential pardon to Niko Goramia, who was also accused in jail together with Saakashvili. And this is a good sign overall, given that Polish Doctors are also being given access to Saakashvili. I am in close contact with those people who are monitoring that situation in Georgia. And next week we'll have uh, Nikola Gorame in our stream. Uh, so do not forget to click the bell button and be aware of other future releases. See you, Alexia, on Monday.